When the weather turns cold and their insect prey disappear, some bat species turn to caves and mines to hibernate in Wisconsin. With over 200 of these underground sites, every cave is unique. It's really difficult to choose a favorite. But one of our state's rock stars is Kickapoo Caverns. In my 20 years working in hundreds of caves across Wisconsin, I've seen some pretty unique sights. But what strikes me most about this cave is the rich diversity of stories it has to tell. In the cave today, we'll look at the powerful role water plays in nearly every aspect of its existence, the many ways humans have impacted this site over two centuries, and the secretive lives of bats who rely on the cave's protective shelter as they fight for survival. Come with me as we head underground. Kickapoo Caverns is one of 27 nature preserves protected by Mississippi Valley Conservancy here in Wisconsin's Driftless Area. These unique properties are protected and managed to enhance biodiversity and to protect native species from the threats of development and climate change. The underground cave itself is only accessible for special summer tours, while the bats are out roosting in the woodlands. Above ground, the nature preserve is open to the public year-round for hiking, hunting, birding, and snowshoeing. Visit the Mississippi Valley Conservancy website for directions and more information. Caves are naturally formed openings in the bedrock, large enough to admit a person. But most of Wisconsin's caves are small. The entrances often look like nothing more than an animal burrow. The entrance to Kickapoo Caverns is covered by a building today, but what the original cave entrance looked like is one of the many mysteries of this place. We don't even know if the cave was opened naturally by erosion, or if it was dug open by lead miners on the bluff in the early 1800s. There's so much that we don't know about this place. We don't know when or how fast it formed or exactly how old it is. But despite all of these uncertainties, we can gain a general picture of what happened here by examining the bedrock walls and the shape of the cave. Fossil clues help reveal that this cave's story is 400 million years in the making. The rock around us was once an ocean reef when the land that is now Wisconsin sat near the equator. Today, this open space that we call a cave is actually an enlarged fracture or joint in the ancient bedrock. Mildly acidic groundwater slowly ate away the rock around the fracture, and as the water table lowered over time, a space 40 feet high was exposed. If we look at a map of this cave, we can see that it's shaped like a long hollow tube with constrictions and bulges that form what become the five largest rooms or caverns that we'll see today. This one is called Myotis Alley. With 1,400 feet of surveyed cave passages, Kickapoo Caverns is one of the longest caves in Wisconsin. Flowing water continued to sculpt the cave, leaving scallops, domes, and arches behind. And water is still responsible for decorating the cave today. In karst landscapes, caves can impact the quality of our drinking water. Caves are nature's plumbing pipes, and the sinkholes that generally form cave entrances are surface drains, channeling water underground and into the cave system, where the open space allows water to travel freely and move quickly downward, bypassing the filtering properties of surface soils and the sponge-like pores in bedrock. Eventually, the water may emerge as a spring at the base of this bluff. Like the water, contaminants that enter a karst aquifer are transported rapidly, creating water quality problems. It's important to keep sinkholes free of garbage and agricultural runoff. 
Buffer zones around sinkholes help to slow and filter water before it enters a cave system. By protecting the forest and oak openings above and around the cave, Mississippi Valley Conservancy is also helping to keep drinking water clean. The beautiful stone formations we see decorating the cave today were also formed by water, drop by minuscule drop. They're called speleothems, and they're made of the mineral calcite, but they form differently based on a variety of conditions, giving a variety of shapes, colors, and textures to the cave. Here you can see soda straw stalactites decorating the ceiling. Soda straws are thin and hollow like their name implies. They form when a drop of water clings to the ceiling, leaving a ring of tiny calcite crystals each time it falls. The rings build up over time to form a hollow tube. It can take hundreds or even thousands of years for just a small amount of calcite to build up. Caves are time capsules. The layers of calcite themselves capture clues to past climate conditions. By reading the isotopic signatures of cave formations, like this stalagmite, researchers can tell how old the layers were when they first formed and whether the land above the cave was frozen or not. In some Wisconsin caves, the last time a stalagmite grew was hundreds of thousands of years ago. While water has left its mark on the cave, we humans have also left ours. We've come down 30 feet from the cave entrance using stairways placed in the cave decades ago. But the cave's first explorers would have used ropes and ladders to arrive in this, the cathedral room. With its four-story high ceiling, it's the tallest spot inside the cave. One can only imagine how excited and perhaps even fearful the first explorers would have felt, traveling all this way with only the light of a candle or lantern. One journalist even brought a gun that he fired at the eyes of a goblin encountered in a crawlway, although it was likely one of the most common cave inhabitants, a raccoon. While we can't be certain, 200-year-old historical documents hint at Indian stories about this site. And there's evidence to suggest that lead miners digging on this bluff as early as 1821 may have made their way inside the cave. With no oversight, the visits of these early explorers impacted the cave. Some broke stalactites to take as souvenirs. And for more than a century, hundreds of early visitors used pencil lead and candle smoke to memorialize their visits. Being able to leave your mark and show that you had traveled in the darkest recesses from the entrance was a status symbol, an indication of your bravery. Each visitor would have had to squeeze through a narrow passage that, at the time, was almost completely filled by clay in order to reach this tiny room, the register room. Although we view graffiti in a negative light today, these signatures serve to remind us how strong the sense of place is here inside the cave. We can even find the names of the families who owned this property over the decades. And it's not just men or boys who crawled to this place. There are women's names among the signatures. At a time when automobile travel on improved roads was taking tourists to caves across the country, some people who owned a hole in the ground figured if you could build a few steps, buy a few lanterns, and tell stories, that you could charge people for their visits. Known at the time as Lathrop's Cave, it had already become a proven draw for visitors. But developing this cave for regular tours would be a significant task. After an intense effort to construct a road from the state highway to the cave, a brick building was laid over the entrance, and finally, on July 4th of 1947, everything was ready. A formal dance would kick off the grand opening of the already historic cave, now billed as Kickapoo Crystal Caverns, and people lined up to pay the 50 cent admission fee and descend on wooden steps through the first long passageway. Boardwalks kept their feet dry, since the floor of the room is frequently flooded. Art Deco-style bathroom lighting fixtures glowed brightly in the darkness, illuminating the cavern's pools and features. 
Payne visitors marveled at the white and honey-colored flowstones and stalactites, hundreds of delicate white soda straws that decorated the ceiling, and ribbons of blue-black manganese that flowed down the cave walls. Over time, different owners used different approaches to entice the public to the cave, from name changes to fanciful tales and Native American imagery. One owner installed a lighted wooden cross and visitors on tours listened to the resonant sound of hymns broadcast in the cathedral room, where a number of weddings even took place. During the 1950s, this cave and others like it were listed as fallout shelters, but that didn't solve the problem encountered by most commercial cave owners. How to generate new interest from the public? New places to explore were part of the solution. For millennia, water washed into Wisconsin's caves, bringing with it clay sediment that nearly fills most underground passageways in our state. Kickapoo Caverns is no exception. In the 1960s, the cave passages that lay beyond the cathedral room were painstakingly dug open by the Godowski family, who owned the cave at the time. The newly accessible rooms could now be visited by tour groups. Saved from the damaging hands of unscrupulous early explorers, the stalactites and other speleothems here are pristine. There's no doubt that humans have impacted this cave, but today the main goal of the Mississippi Valley Conservancy is to protect the bat population that hibernates here each winter and allow access for professional researchers and resource managers to advance and share knowledge about the cave and its inhabitants. And that brings us to my own involvement in the current chapter of this cave's story. Each winter, my colleagues and I at the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources survey this and many other Wisconsin caves for bats. The cave feels warm compared to the freezing temperatures outside. Working quickly in the dark of the cave with only our headlamps, we quietly search for and count the three species of bats that hibernate here. Hibernation is a survival strategy bats use when insect prey are not available. The high ceilings in this cave keep them safely out of the reach of predators like raccoons. The secured entrance, total darkness, and near total silence ensure that they aren't disturbed. But it's the stable, temperature and humidity down here that bats need most. The cool, humid air allows them to lower their body temperature to near 50 degrees and hibernate without freezing or dehydrating. Bats reduce their heart rate to conserve energy, from an astonishing 500 beats per minute when they're flying to just four beats per minute. They may only draw one breath every 10 minutes. By the time spring comes, they will have spent half the year underground and will have lost almost one-third of their body weight. They do this year after year. And now each winter, when we return, we hope to find surviving bats because there's a killer lurking in this cave. The white nose syndrome fungus is everywhere here at Kickapoo Caverns. It's come in on bats, but it's established itself on the walls and in soil, and it's waiting here every year. So even the bats lucky enough to survive it one winter will have to return to face it again the next. The fungus doesn't harm humans. Our bodies are too warm to make good hosts. The fungus is what's called psychrophilic, meaning cold loving, so it grows best between 39 and 51 degrees, the very same temperature range that holds steady in underground sites like this. And when bats lower their own body temperature to hibernate, they also suppress their immune systems, creating the perfect conditions for the fungus to grow on and into their skin. The growing fungus causes thousands of tiny wounds, shown here under an ultraviolet light we use to help assess the damage to a bat's skin. It disrupts a bat's hibernation strategy. As this occurs, the bat also begins to wake up every few days, using a lot of energy in the process. After several bouts of arousal, the bat is starving and either dies inside the cave or ventures out onto the frozen landscape in search of insects, 
only to die of exposure. White-nose syndrome has killed millions of little brown bats and other species in North America, reducing most hibernating populations by 95 to 99 percent. Since its arrival in Wisconsin in 2014, we've watched most of our bats disappear almost before our eyes. In Wisconsin, we're working with other scientists from around the world to understand how white-nose syndrome affects bats and how to help them survive it. That includes developing treatments and biological controls, like beneficial bacteria or probiotics, and even a vaccine for white-nose syndrome, a project that Kickapoo Caverns has provided support for by becoming a host for testing of the vaccine in the field. These large enclosures helped us ensure that wild bats remained in this cave after they were experimentally vaccinated for white-nose syndrome over the past couple of winters. That field trial was part of a much larger project taking place at the USGS National Wildlife Health Center to try to help bats survive the disease. In addition to developing treatments, we're also investigating why some bats survive white-nose syndrome. At Kickapoo Caverns and other caves, that means marking surviving bats with wing bands to track individuals over time, exploring the rates of survival in different sites, and research to learn why certain individuals survive exposure to the fungus year after year. One thing's for sure, there are no easy solutions to the challenges posed by white-nose syndrome, and there's no silver bullet cure. But we are learning step by step, about the disease and the individuals that survive with it. The White Nose Syndrome journey is not unlike exploring a cave. We can only see as far as our headlamps in the darkness, but we make the entire journey that way. And so we've reached the end of this cave, over a thousand feet from the entrance. We're standing in the Pipistrel Pool Room, the last accessible place we can travel to. No natural light has ever penetrated here. Some caves, like this one, are shared by both humans and bats and can be successfully managed accordingly. Despite occasional organized tours in the summer months, the Conservancy closes the cave in late August each year to protect the bats who arrive at the cave for their mating season and hibernation. And for visitors that do enter this cave in summer, White Nose Syndrome education is part of every tour because it's our small actions as individuals that can have great impact on both animal and human health. Those of us who study bats find reasons for hope despite the immense challenges posed by the threat of white nose syndrome. After all, this is a group of mammals that's been around on this planet for nearly 50 million years. And if we've learned anything about them, it's that bats are tenacious, incredibly resilient, and highly adapted animals. And if there's anything that this cave reminds me of, it's that change over time is slow, but continuous, and that we must wait, probably longer than our lifetimes, to see what stories unfold next, both for North American bats and for Kickapoo Caverns. While our bat science community is working in laboratories, in forests late at night, or in caves deep underground, here are some ways that you can help bats too. Control invasive plant species. Keep out of caves in winter. It's always a good idea to put up a bat house. Count and report your bat roost. Finally, be a bat champion. Learn and share. Visit the whitenosesyndrome.org website for more information. We thank Jennifer Riddell of the Wisconsin DNR for sharing her expertise to help us protect and manage the caves at Kickapoo Caverns for Wisconsin's bat population. You'll find more about this special place and all the public nature preserves of our community-supported organization at MississippiValleyConservancy.org. Thanks for watching this Link to the Land tour. We hope to see you on the trail again soon.